Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on July 3rd, 2022, are from Isaiah chapter 66, 10 through 14. The alternate first reading is 2 Kings 5, 1 through 14. The Psalm 66, 1 through 9. The second reading, our last reading in Galatians chapter 6, maybe 1 through 6, but why not 7 through 16. And then Luke chapter 10, 1 through 11 and 16 through 20. Or why not throw in verses 12 through 15 as well and right. hear about the woes to all of these cities are going to be destroyed. Yes. Woe to Tyre and Sidon. Woe to, right. Mm -hmm. Good plan. (laughs) There's a, there's a a consequence for not. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Where do, where, where would you all go this week with there this time around with this passage from Luke. I have to say, and I'm not going to to repeat it all, but um, um, Tommy Givens, uh, who teaches at Fuller Theological Seminary, and I think is uh, this sermon is on their chapel website. He preached this text uh, around 2016, and I still can't get it out of my imagination. And the focus of it that um, I, I just wonder if preachers might want to think about is what does it mean for us to go out in the moment we live in and bring the kingdom of God present? And I know that's simply what the text says, but what Givens did was to paint the picture of our world alongside of this text in a way that I just, this text is real for me because it's real people going into their world, not with the scriptural language of harvest, but uh, with the actual promise of God showing up and healing and bringing hospitality and welcoming and recognizing that if folks don't want to hear God's truth, you keep telling that truth and it's okay to move on so that you don't change the message that God is promising to welcome, to restore, and to bring hospitality. Hmm. I think that's a good, I like that point, Joy, of of, that you, rather than change the message (laughs) to get the hearer to to respond and to accept, uh, you you maintain that integrity about the message and you move on. Some people don't want to hear it. And that's, of course, a major theme in in Luke. It was true for Jesus and Nazareth. Uh, It will be true for uh, the woman, the women who witness the empty tomb, and they go back to the disciples, and they think it's a bunch of Leros. So it's it's a major theme in Luke of this embedded rejection of the message, and and what do we, what will be our, what will, and so the one of the issues with this text is what will be our response to that, to that re- that certain rejection, uh, or frequent maybe rejection, <laughs> uh, and to uh, to what we are proclaiming. I think, you know, the, the thing that uh, the commentary talks about that I, it, it's one of those things like, you know, these little details that you've read, you've read these passages a hundred times and, and that you, uh, and particularly when it comes to dwelling in staying within one gospel, the opening lines of the commentary, Luke envisions the mission of the kingdom carried out by many of Jesus' followers, not just a chosen few. And that, and, and she takes us back to uh, verses eight, one through three, where the 12 apostles and many women are described as being with Jesus. And so this, this extraordinary, you just have this vision already of this extraordinarily inclusive group uh or in that it inclusion of it's uh you know going back to 
going back to that, you know, the travel narrative has begun. It's like, you know, it, it it's like Jesus is collecting all these people <laughs> uh, that are that are going to make it possible for the vision that Luke Acts has that you will be my witnesses in 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 Jerusalem and Judea and to the ends of the earth and I uh, and so I just had yeah I just had this vision of like you know more and more and more and more people follow along and and just and how big and expansive that group is uh, and not just these chosen few. I, I just love, I don't know, I love that. I could see myself there. <laughs> I remember this is the gospel where critics say that he sure likes spending a lot of time eating. He <laughs> sure likes, he sure seems to drink too much. Um, right, that's part of his, and so here this is the, the, the nature of the ministry we've talked in years past to know about hospitality, but it's mm -hmm. It's partly go to people. Yes, you have a message. Yes, you have the power to heal, but sit with them and eat with them and drink with them, which is, mm -hmm. which is as we know, how communities get created and sustained and that kind of shared space uh, together. So I think if I were preaching on this this weekend, I would probably dig into what can we tell about what the first century church was like, not as an exercise in nostalgia, not to make us feel guilty about what we're like today, because it's not all bad, but just to think about how do we learn from this idea of a community that is, is creating these little alternate societies where it pops up, or these alternate ways of getting uh, integrated or involved or connected one to another. Because then the message is really simple. The sermon, I could even memorize that one, right? The kingdom of God is near. I'm sorry, it has come near to you. See, I can't memorize it, but... <laughs> So what does that mean then? And to really explore with people, what would that look like? Like, how could you say the kingdom of God has come near to you with any kind of confidence? And so what's going on in our own congregation? What's going on in our own community? What would that message sound like to different kinds of people in different kinds of circumstances, whether comfortable and no real worries or people who are in more dire straits? And really to spend some time with that. It's not rocket science, right? It's not that difficult what he's asking them to do of course there's going to be opposition and hostility but he's asking them to make communities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the, theolo the theology takes care of itself in some ways when you do that mm -hmm. and when that is the message over and over and over again mm -hmm. you know don't change the message mm -hmm. and that's how it grows mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i i think that that repetition of that in the in this passage of you know the kingdom of God has come near to you and then in verse eleven again yet know this the kingdom of God has come near uh, is yeah the way in which that nearness is um, kind of embodied if you will in that in those hospitable moments of community that intimacy. And so that the, the way in which these communities are, are formed and these, these, these spaces and places of hospitality, that's what, that's what nearness looks like, or that's what nearness feels like, uh, you know, near can, near can kind of be abstract, you know what I mean? Like, well, how far is it, is it like 10 feet away? Is it, you know, is it, is it? 20 feet away? Is it a couple miles away? You know, what does nearness mean? And, but really what ha what's happening in this passage is a, is a nearness that is, yeah, as I said, that's just, that's embodied in these intimate um, moments of hospitality. That's what nearness feels like. Uh, and that's something else. Maybe I would, a direction I might go. Would you tie that to Isaiah 66 then? I mean, talk about nearness. I was thinking that very same thing. Yeah. Because that that's this idea of of uh, a mother comforting her child. Yeah. Yeah. And um in in this recognition that um um what I like to call the th the three volumes of Isaiah just remembering this context of of this is not the uh, prophetic warning. This is not the description of the exile. This is on the other side when, uh, to use the gospel language, when the kingdom is near, when the kingdom has come. 
And mm -hmm. this is the time to move from lament to rejoicing. This is the moment to experience that hospitality and to be grateful in it. Yeah, and that in mean, definitely with with the language and the imagery that you're getting in Isaiah 66 of that's what nearness feels like, right? It feels like comfort. It feels like uh, drinking deeply. Um, that to exactly? extend that that hospitality uh, metaphor uh, from you know from this consoling Luke. breast. I mean, it just really. Yeah, I, I think putting it's almost like putting sort of flesh and you know flesh and blood on on this abstract concept of nearness mm -hmm. that you can do both with, as you said, Matt, the communities that are being created because of uh, because of this promise of the kingdom of God coming near, but also with the language language from Isaiah. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be really powerful, German. Oh yeah, when, when you think about the this isn't just shared space. This is literally a shared biology that's talked yeah. about here, you know? Yeah. Is... yeah. Bodies interacting bodies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Plus yeah. you're, you get to use the verb dandled, which is one of my favorite verbs that I never use, but to be dandled on her knees is just a lovely expression. It is. <laughs> so hospitality yeah. is not a banana or fruit on the, the counter. Hospitality mm -hmm. is nursing at the breast of your mother. Yeah, bouncing on your knee, on the knee. And yeah, this is beautiful, really is. Yeah, and it could, I think it could, uh, I think it could just kind of explode people's minds when you think of what that. There's your children's sermon. Yeah. <laughs> As somebody with a newborn, just, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. I haven't dandled any <laughs> anybody on my knee for quite some time. <laughs> My you can do that for the children's sermon and get paid for it. How great is that, right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, good. Uh, the alternate first reading, Second Kings. Uh, we've got Naaman, who uh, was, of course, referred to in Luke four twenty seven. So you could make that connection that this is the Naaman that that Jesus was talking about, and people are like, "Not him! Not Naaman, the Syrian king! No way!" That's not who the that's not who the kingdom is for, uh, but uh, but yes, indeed it is. And I really, really appreciated the the commentary on this passage. I just would invite preachers to spend some time in that, uh, especially the last paragraph. Mm -hmm. uh, the Old Testament account does not ignore the horrendous suffering that Naaman has inflicted, yet it prompts readers to resist. The hateful caricatures and the leprous demonizing of enemies, even when that demonizing is well deserved. The, em the enemy who perpetrates violence and brutality is no less a human being and those who are its victims. Enemies can be healed, and even victims can fall prey to a diseased soul. Or as a modern prophet proclaimed, hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. I just that that may be, I had to think, I had to sit in that paragraph for a while and really contemplate that <laughs> what the what the call is here uh and maybe that's why they want to throw jesus off a cliff like no i get it <laughs> yeah this is definitely telling the same story over and over again not just to the people we want to hear it not just to the people that are part of our insider group or our community or, or our tribe that we have to tell it to our neighbors that once were our enemies. And this is uh, that that text um, makes that um, language that uh, we used earlier in Luke about telling that same promise uh, so real because this is the this is the one person, uh, this represents the one person we probably don't want to say, God's got something good for you too. And yet this is the one person that needs to hear it. And they might just need to hear it directly from us. Uh, and and I love this story because um, the the one that he hears it from is the least likely uh, to be able to to offer it. Um, that this little girl shows up, and she's not just any little girl, you know, in the house. She's the servant girl, and yet she is the one that says, 
to someone that we do have this picture of being less than the perfect person to say, really? You, you're, you were asked to do something so simple by someone whose reputation, te, reputation is so great. Why don't you give it a try? Lord, make me willing to do that with my enemies, with those that I deem irredeemable. And then let me step aside and see what happens when you show up. It's such an interesting text. Um, because it almost always falls on 4th of July weekend when it's on the lectionary. So you've got mm -hmm. questions of national pride, whose river is better than whose, you know, and there's the, mm -hmm. there's a bit of a competition going back and forth between Naaman and, and, and Elisha. So, which is part of it, uh, you know, news moves so quickly. I have no idea what things are going to be like in Ukraine when this podcast comes up, but to think about the, the horrors of war, that last paragraph that, that you pointed out, Caroline, is just so important there that this is, mm -hmm. um, yeah, Naaman appears to be not, if not a horrible person in general, at least, you know, he represents uh, tremendous suffering mm -hmm. that they've experienced in Samaria. And um, nevertheless, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's part of the, uh, that's part of the, um, it's the word I want, the offense of the story that right. it is a story about the, the, the prophet's power, right. God's capacity to heal, but God's right. capacity to do that for them. I mean, it's, it's maybe it's the old Testament version of the, the good Samaritan parable in some ways, right? That please mm -hmm. anybody, but him, let the hero or let the beneficiary be anybody, but that guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Or don't make me be the one that has to tell them about God's good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. How about the psalm? What would you do with the psalm this week? This is your line. I'd use it liturgically. Yeah, I know. <laughs> me too. <laughs> it's always the answer. I know it is always the answer, unless Rolf is here. So, um, <laughs> sorry, Rolf, but when you come back, you can correct the errors of our ways when it comes to the psalm. But, but it, but in many in many respects, it is a liturgical response to what we just said, you know, that the, uh, as the commentary on the Naaman uh, story says, uh, Jesus lifts up Naaman as an illustration of the expansive scope of God's love. And uh, how awesome are your deeds, oh God. Uh, so that's how I would, yeah. It's, you know, it's a response, I think, to the with the Isaiah text, but it's also it could work as a response to the name and text. Yeah. If you want to follow my children's sermon idea and you know have a baby there, what do babies do when they've been fed when they're happy and right? Yeah. They make noise. So yeah. yeah. They do. They giggle and they oh yeah. Yeah. I actually did a children's sermon like that once where I um gave the the um the kids noisemakers and, and then I told them to make a joyful noise because the noisemakers were joyful. Um, and it kept the kids alert during this, the sermon, but I didn't particularly win any friends among the parents exactly. who thought that yeah. children should be seen yeah. and heard. Thanks for the kazoo for the drive home, Pastor. I was just going to say, I, kazoo, that'll do it. <laughs> and it was kazoos and um, um, the little clappers. And, shake around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can get like a hundred of those for 50, you know, for $5 or something like that. <laughs> just what I did. <laughs> all right we've got our last reading in galatians if you didn't you know uh go rogue as i suggested and do this the uh the fruits of the spirit but our last again a powerhouse portion of the of you know the ending of galatians that uh that really and we've talked about this i know like uh, every time it comes up i know we say this but but it's really what's at stake for Paul in the letter to the Galatians that for neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but, and we know to delete that a right, uh, the indefinite article and, but new creation is everything. And that's, and the way in which the way in which uh, Galatianism happens all the time in our mm -hmm. churches of those, uh, those 
acts or those uh, requirements that uh, to be a part of the kingdom of God, to be a part of the body of Christ. And we do it all the time. And, and what gets Paul so uh, upset with the Galatians, right, is then, and, and that comes out, of course, in his rhetoric and the absence of the Thanksgiving, is that this is new creation, people. And, and uh, how is it that, you know, how is it that you can still try to fit what God, you know, what God has done in Jesus? How can you still try to fit it into uh, these, the ways in which we think uh, community should be uh, constructed and, uh, and church should look like? So that's where I would go. Yeah, and it's not renewed creation, or it's not the same old society, but now you get a second chance at it. It's all the, think back to chapter three a couple of weeks ago in Galatians, all of the norms, all of the categories, all of the advantages and privileges have been leveled. And what does it mean to live? It's almost an unlivable way of imagining life, mm -hmm. but uh, that's where the gospel seems to point us. Mm -hmm.